Well, welcome everybody. Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I wanted to welcome you here today for this important conversation on COVID-19 and its impact on synagogues and spiritual communities. Uh, JFN is really gratified that we've been able to, in the last, um, I guess it's almost been seven or eight weeks, bring a group of funders and key stakeholders together to really learn about the needs, hear from people in the field and experts in the field, hear about the funder's perspective, and then come together to really start thinking about the role of philanthropy at this moment and how we can think about what is gonna be and how we can be helpful in the post COVID reality. And so with, oh, and a little about logistics before we jump right in is that we have a few presenters today that um, will have a lot of good information to, to share with us. Please use the chat function to ask your questions and engage with them and with the other participants. And at the end, we'll have a lot of time towards the end of the session for more interactive um, Q&A and back and forth and sharing of our thoughts and our experiences. And at that point, we'll ask people to unmute themselves and share their script and to you know, share their video and we can all come together as a community to talk and to learn. And so now without further ado, I would like to introduce Adina Friedman from UJA Federation. She's been such a wonderful partner in bringing this this virtual meetup together, and she will do some more framing and introduce the fellow panelists. Thank you, Adina. Great, thank you so much, Tamar. And thank you to the Jewish Funders Network for hosting this briefing, and to the panelists, our speakers, who each in their own right have more than full plates right now, but made the time to join us so that we can increase our awareness around the impact of COVID on the synagogue and spiritual community sector. Can everyone hear me? Okay, just a nod, excellent. So UJA Federation of New York has been committed to strengthening the synagogue sector for close to two decades. With over 600 congregations spanning the denominations, urban suburban, home-based minyanim to 2000 plus mega congregations, our challenges and opportunities have always been to consider what the unique role of philanthropy ought be and how what we're learning in New York could be a microcosm for the broader synagogue sector. Prior to March 2020, our conversations about synagogues revolved around how we might help accelerate the rate of change. We would often say that synagogues were taking an evolutionary approach to what we see as a revolutionary time, given the rate of change that is impacting across every sector. Enter COVID-19, and what we see is that legacy institutions that struggle to quickly adapt prior to this moment had no choice and were forced to adapt quickly. It is if we have leapfrogged decades in a couple of months. So how can we keep the momentum going? How can we take the lessons and the inspiration from the creativity and innovation into the next phase instead of retreating to the way we've always done it? How do we use this moment of clarity to hone what is most essential on a personal and communal level? Can we gain clarity of purpose for our synagogues and spiritual communities? And then how can we hone our communal resources to create the collective impact that we seek? To explore these questions and a few more, we have invited this esteemed group of professionals. Today, you will hear from Rabbi Jacob Blumenthal, Chief Executive of the Rabbinical Assembly. Just give a little wave so folks can see you who was recently appointed joint CEO of USCJ in the Rabbinical Assembly, and we'll assume that role in the beginning of July, although I'm sure in many ways you've already stepped into those shoes. Rabbi Sharon Brous, Senior Rabbi of Ikar. Amy Asin, Vice President and Director of Strengthening Congregations at the Union for Reform Judaism. Nadine Kochavi, Director of Synagogue Strategy and my colleague at UJA Federation of New York. Ari Rokoff, Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Orthodox Union. And so many of you, thank you so much, funders and philanthropists who have joined us today to hear about the impact on the synagogue sector and that of spiritual communities. A brief agenda for today's call. We're gonna begin with what I call a from the street view to the balcony view, an opportunity to hear some reflections from Rabbi Sharon Browse. Then we're gonna turn it to our panelists to hear about the short-term immediate impact then an opportunity to reflect on the longer term impact on our sector. And finally, we'll open it up to a conversation about what the unique role of philanthropy might be at this moment. So now I would like to turn it to Rabbi Sharon Braus. Sharon, thank you. Hey, thank, thank you all so much. I wanna 
especially thank Tamar, Adina, and Nadine uh, for putting this together and for inviting me to be a part of it. And it, it's really good to see um, some familiar faces from uh, from the other coast. So, uh, so thank you to, to all of you. And thank you for convening this conversation. Um, it seemed like in the first couple of weeks, we were all in a, um, in a real scramble to try and figure For the last few weeks now, people are starting to ask bigger questions about what the implications of this time will be um, and what we might be able to learn from it so that we can begin to build toward a different kind of future. So as we begin this conversation today about what will be the long-term impact of the virus on our Jewish community and our Jewish communities, I want to start um, by sharing with you something that I learned uh, from my friend, Reverend Michael Ray Matthews, who is at Faith in Action. He shared uh, with me just last week that, uh, that they had developed at Faith in Action a mission statement in the midst of the Ferguson uprising in 2014. And that mission statement became the guiding principle for them over the course of the last six years and still to this day is very much at the forefront of their thinking as an organization. And this is what it is. If we're not cultivating a moral imagination together, we're probably living inside someone else's. If we're not cultivating a moral imagination together, we're probably living inside someone else's. And I think that what this awakens in me is the need to really push forward and advance a conversation, even in this time of, um, of incredible fear and uncertainty, of anger, of exhaustion, the need to, to cultivate moral imagination together. Um, and we know that in many ways, the environment that we're living in right now is really the antithesis of what's needed in order to think in a generative and creative way and really begin to engage in the process of reimagining. And yet it's absolutely critical that we seize this moment. Some of us have really come to recognize and appreciate the, the power of Shabbat in a different way than we ever have before through the course of this time. Um, our calendar calls us into a kind of deep accounting it, it very dramatically every single Shabbat. And it's been really a godsend, a time that pulls us out of the world as it is and asks us to engage in the work of moral imagination of what could be. But we can do that as individuals. It's very hard to find the opportunities to do that as a society. And yet, over the course of the past two months, our society has in some ways engaged in the closest thing to uh, to, to a worldwide Shabbat. I'm sure some of you saw the incredible poem written by Reverend Lynn Unger um, just in, in March called uh, Pandemic that, that said we should treat this time the way the Jews treat the Sabbath. And what we see happening right now is that, you know, over the course of the last six to eight weeks, the world has really pressed pause. Even the subways in New York City, as you all know better than I do, are now shutting down from 1 to 5 a.m. so that they can actually do a deep clean. We've seen that global commerce has essentially halted. We've seen that all around the world, um, air traffic is essentially at a standstill as retail's been shuttered, at res restaurants have been closed. The world is essentially pressed pause. And now we're just starting in the course of the last two weeks to enter the phase of mad scramble to reclaim the world as it was. Um, and many of us are very concerned about what that's going to look like, particularly because it will put those who are most vulnerable really right back on the front lines. But in the midst of all of this, I want to share that I've been thinking about the words of two wise women who are um, very dear to me. One is Rabbi Kayla LaBelle, who's our Jewish Emergent Network fellow at IKAR who said right when we entered this, uh, this strange time in March, she said, we have to be very careful that as we step off the express train, we don't just build a new virtual express train that's moving just as quickly as the other one did. Instead, we have to stop and think, what will we hear if we give ourselves a minute to actually listen? And on a very similar vein, I hear the words of my friend Valerie Kaur, who's a Sikh American civil rights activist who wrote in March, what I wish for you is stillness. This is a time to gather facts and then get quiet and summon our deepest wisdom and let that wisdom lead us. Because this time will test who we wanna be as individuals and as people. Will we succumb to fear and self-interest or will we double down on love? To get quiet 
and summon our deepest wisdom. That's what we presumably do on Shabbat, or at least what Shabbat affords us the opportunity to do as individuals, but we so rarely have the opportunity to do as a society. And so now, as we stand on the precipice of some kind of return, I am desperate for us to embrace what might be the final days of stillness and to eke out whatever it is that we're called to learn from this beautiful and unnaturally natural time, to see how this time might have created the space for a new kind of moral imagining. Adina, you're already making reference to the fact that we have learned from this time, and in many ways this has pushed the clock forward for people in a way that, that, that no, no amount of philanthropic dollars could have otherwise. Instead, we're starting to think differently, and it's incumbent upon us that we do this kind of deep thinking in, as, as a moral reimagining. What might we do with the streets of our cities if we had the shared will? What might, how might we care for one another now that we know that that kind of broad-based care really matters? How might we care for our earth now that we've been reminded of what the unblemished sky actually looks like? What might love look like when it's built into the social order? What will we do as a society with our newfound awareness of the structural inequities that plague us as those who are most harmed by this lockdown are the very same people who are most vulnerable to the early reopenings, predominantly those who are poor and those who are black, as we've seen that this virus and this illness is really not striking all of us evenly, as my teacher Rabbi Marcella Bronstein said yesterday, we are not all in the same boat. We're all in the same storm, but we are not all in the same boat. And I believe that it's incumbent that we ask these questions also of, of ourselves as a Jewish community. How will we respond to this economic crisis, to this political crisis, to the spiritual crisis that this virus is revealing to us? And what have we learned about community, about Shabbat, about who we prioritize and who we neglect in our communities, about who and how we pay health benefits to the people who work as Jewish communal professionals, who we're willing to leave vulnerable, or will we not be willing to leave anyone vulnerable? How insular or how expansive are we and should we be? How particular and how universal? This conversation needs to go far beyond whether we return to pews so that we can better physically distance or if the, or if the new chair setup is gonna be more advantageous for us, or if we should keep running Zoom minyanim once we're able to again gather in person together. Those questions matter, but there are much deeper questions that we need to be asking as a community. And I'm asking us in these last remaining moments of stillness, when we're still relatively free from the noise and the chaos and the business and the busyness of the world as it was, what do we hear? What do we dream of for our community? If we're not cultivating a moral imagination together, we are probably living inside someone else's. And I know that what we've learned is that we will need to be brave when all of this is behind us. We will need to be visionary. Who we are as a people will matter even more than it did before this pandemic. What is our Jewish community and what do we need it to be? And I really pray that from this time with all of its loss and all of its pain, we also find an opening now to begin to cultivate a moral imagination together that will be worthy of the new Jewish community and the new world that we will be called to build on the other side of all of this. Amen. Thank you so much, Sharon. <clears throat> really, I think words of inspiration, you know, we need to all take a deep breath and take in that silence, as you mentioned, I think it's a great call to action for us as individuals and as a community. So as this moment does call for a tremendous moral leadership and courageous leadership, as many have said in this time, we start with a grounding around what is happening and we move from there to what do we project might happen and then we think about where we wanna take our communities and our institutions. So I'm gonna now turn it to our panelists to address the question around how this particular moment, how COVID-19 and the residual impacts have affected our synagogue and spiritual communities, specifically in the short 
and immediate term. We're going to focus on a number of different aspects. We're going to focus on, first we're going to hear a bit about um, some of the concrete needs and some of the data that has emerged from this time. Then we're going to hear about how this has impacted caring communities, our view around education in synagogues. We're going to talk about how this has impacted the ritual space. I know, Sharon, you didn't speak to this much, but um, there's a lot to say about how, um, how this has impacted rabbis, rabbiing, cantoring, um, and, you know, and the whole role of pastoral care, etc. cetera. Um, finan the financial realm in synagogues, as we can imagine, as the economic impact is global, to hear specifically about how it's impacted. And then what is the innovation that we're seeing uh, within the arena of engagement and outreach? So I'm going to start by turning it to my colleague Nadine Kochavi to quickly take us through some of the data that we've seen. And uh, unmute you. Okay, Great. Now Thank can... you, Azine. Yeah. You can hear me and can you see my screen? Perfect. Great. Thank you. So as Azina mentioned, we um, have some data that we would like to share from you. UJA Federation is committed to collecting um, data from our New York congregations about the needs um, and the facts on the ground. So this assessment was done in March 2020, which was really just the beginning of all this. So you can imagine as things are progressing quite um, rapidly, some of these responses have been um, changing over time and we're actually about to send out a second needs assessment um, but I wanted, thought it would be just to help frame the conversation to learn of some of the things we've heard. So one of the first questions we asked are, what are the most pressing financial risks associated with COVID-18 for your synagogue? Um, we had about 96 respondents, of 40, about half of them said it was around the uh, being able to pay salary staff. Um, and that at that time, they were thinking about layoffs and pay cuts. We know that rate has probably changed now with the SBA, thankfully for the SBA loans. I'm sure that percentage has changed, and I'm going to talk at the end about the intervention that UJA helps and um, move that number down, thankfully. Um, but a loss of the revenue re uh, sources was uh, was identified as a common fear around the ideas of. And we know that synagogues, a lot of the rental, um, the revenue comes around fundraising, facility rentals, tuition program fees, and membership fees. Um, sorry. I'm just having trouble progressing. Okay. What are your synagogue's COVID response plans? Um, again, at the beginning of all this, a majority of respondents were conducting adult education programming online, um, as well as their services and ritual experiences. 46% uh, started offering religious school and youth programming along, online. 30% of respondents have organized staff volunteer outreach to check in on all scenario members on a regular basis, and 26% of respondents mentioned new offerings to connect and support their communities virtually. Again, I'm sure all these percentages have gone up in the last few weeks. What are some of the pressing needs of synagogues and their members? Um, synagogues, 40, approximately 40% 40 of synagogues report needing general financial support, 19% mentioned support for their most vulnerable members who are sick, who are sick or are high risk. Um, in terms of members themselves, 46% of synagogues responded that their members um, felt socially isolated and really, really looking to connect to their communities and were struggling with mental health issues. And we are hearing that more and more as this um, pandemic progresses as well as a loss of um, financial income and access to food and me medicine were frequently named. So some of our key takeaways um, when we review the findings that um, synagogues are really struggling to financially support their needs and their members' needs, and that there's still a significant fear of revenue loss as this goes on. Um, at the same time, synagogues very much wants to continue to be spiritual communities and to support the needs of their most vulnerable members. And then with the closing of physical spaces, synagogues are considering a variety of innovative approaches that we're gonna talk about with you today to conduct their core businesses and to keep their communities together during this time. I'm gonna turn this back to you, Adina. Great, thank you so much, Nadine. And, and as Nadine mentioned, this is a study that we did about two weeks ago. Um, and we are now in the process of doing a second needs assessment. We would be happy to share the findings with, uh, with this group when we 
get a sense as you know everything is rapidly changing and as i mentioned new york is a somewhat of a microcosm for for what we're seeing in the rest of the country so now as we've been grounded in some of the st statistics uh, i want to turn it now to my colleague amy ason from urj um, to talk to us about some of the other short-term impacts the immediate impacts that we're seeing with a specific focus around caring communities and the education space uh, thanks adina and thanks to everyone uh, for taking the time to be here. Uh, I'm really speaking on what I'm uh, observing across 850 reform congregations in uh, the United States and Canada. Um, and what I'm, what I'm seeing first and foremost is that congregations have shifted their focus from the day-to-day -day grind of delivering program, uh, which is what they spend most of their time doing, uh, to really thinking back on the purpose of the congregation, um, thinking not about uh, worship, education, community, but really thinking about uh, the congregation, uh, as one Rabbi Jeremy Morrison put it, uh, the exploration, uh, a laboratory for the exploration of our imperfections, both of ourselves and our society, um, sort of echoing what uh, Rabbi Brous um, led us off with, really an opportunity to be doing tikkun hanefesh, the repair of the soul, and tikkun ha'olam, the repair of the world. And I think they're doing that by, um, by both in the short term and long term. I actually don't really distinguish between those two. Um, understanding the deeply felt needs of their congregants and thinking about how to, um, how to serve those needs um, in a different way. Uh, again, as uh, Adina said, as she kicked us off, really leapfrogging um, months of uh, uh, years, possibly decades of, of change. They are becoming much more people focused as opposed to institution focused. And they are becoming much more focused on starting with the lives of their congregants and moving towards Torah as opposed to um, feeding Torah um, uh, without necessarily taking into consideration lives. Let me just give you a few um, examples of how that's playing out. Um, even in our largest congregations, even in congregations of 2,000 or 3,000 households, they are calling every single congregant. They're mobilizing armies of volunteers to call every single congregant and understand um, what their needs are, um, getting them online if they don't know how to be online, for example, um, organizing ways to uh, get groceries, uh, to, uh, to congregants. Um, they are doing, spending a lot more time, we're hearing from rabbis, they're spending a lot more time on pastoral care than they ever would have been able to um, in the past. Um, they are uh, offering uh, conversations around the issues that their congregants are caring about most. Um, how can I possibly be a good parent in a time like this? What does holiness mean? when I'm either too close to the people that I, um, that I live with or too far from the people that I care uh, to be with. Um, they're doing good morning rituals and bedtime rituals. And so there's a, a tremendous amount of um, what I would ex call an expanded notion of caring community, uh, which is uh, to really understand the deep need. Um, and I think this is gonna influence High Holy Days as well. Um, one of the questions we're hearing from, uh, from uh, congregational rabbis is, where are the heads of our congregation, congregants going to be? Where are their souls going to be in that moment of high holy days? It's gonna, this is not just about figuring out the technology. This is about really deeply understanding who they are um, and what they need in this moment. And it's led us to believe um, at the URJ that the height of holy days in some ways will be the defining moment for the Jewish community going forward. Um, if we can be, um, if we can understand the deep needs of our congregants and deliver a high holy day, a full high holy day experience, not just uh, uh, five days of services um, in a way that meets those needs um, and catapults us forward, um, we, will, uh, we, will, we will continue to thrive. Um, on the education front, uh, the same thing is happening. Um, people are thinking about their goals. We are gathering 150 educators a week for conversation 
um, about the future and about how what they are learning in this moment will take them into the future. Um, how what they're learning about the balance of knowledge acquisition as a goal and enculturation as a goal. Um, learning what needs to happen, what happens when you get back to basics versus delivering against a curriculum. Um, learning about the balance between uh, the Jewish education of a child and their life and how those two things really ought to be integrated. And so they're taking all of those principles and starting to think about how to move forward. In the immediate notion, they're using that to move some education online. Um, and there's been a lot of conversation, a lot of variety, for example, about how that plays out um, in B'nai Mitzvah and uh, different, uh, different congregations dealing with that differently. So um, I hope this gave you a taste of what's happening in the immediate notion, but what we're really encouraging people to do is not just react and respond in the immediate to drive what we used to do online, but using this as an opportunity to think about those core principles of being people-focused um, and being life-focused. That's great, thank you so much. Very, very helpful insights here. So now we're gonna to move to Ari um, to give us a snapshot around what are the various ways in which this is impacting the ritual sphere. Um, obviously there are differences across the various movements, but, um, but overall I think we've seen um, some significant adaptations, interesting mutations, um, whether it relates to the actual, um, how the rituals are performed or in what way or what's, um, you know, what's permissive, where the creativity is, um, and also uh, in terms of overall participation. Um, so for, you can speak to that and to anything else that you're seeing. And we can't hear you, but it doesn't look like you're muted. Let's try, try again. Yes, now we can, perfectly. So I'll say thank you again uh, to you, Adina, to Nadine, to uh, Tamar, and to, uh, it's really an honor to be part of this uh, panel. And thank you to everyone who's joined from the Jewish Funders Network. It's a big, uh, it's a big, it's a big statement to take this time during the day uh, dedicated to this topic. <clears throat> so um, some of the comments, not surprisingly, um, have that I intended to share were, were already mentioned, but um, I, some of them I'll try to frame in the context of, of ritual practice. And I would like to invite uh, fellow panelists to share their reflections. My reflections here are come from our network of synagogues at the Orthodox Union. We have a, a network of 500 synagogues. And of course they come from my personal, uh, from uh, my basement <laughs> as a member of, uh, of, of my local synagogue as well. So. I'd like to just frame my three observations in the context of, um, of what, I would, what I would call the social distance uh, measure challenge as it relates to ritual. I, um, I think it goes without saying, I don't mean to simplify it, but you know, the concept of a synagogue, big Knesset, uh, Knesset like the Knesset of Israel, a Knesset is, is a gathering. Um, by its absolute definition of synagogue and ritual practice, that's why we, ha are we built the synagogues the way we've built them, that are now empty. And I think it's really, um, it, it's in the area of, of all aspects that we're discussing today, but I think it's important to just put that out there and to also recognize that, you know, we're not, we're not alone in this. All religion uh, streams are really struggling with this, of course. And, you know, we're, we're all looking for the, uh, for the silver lining. So three reflections from, uh, from the trenches, as, as we've said, um, within our community. And again, I, I'd welcome others on the panel to please weigh in, uh, um, you know, in terms of their own observations. So um, I'll start with some good news. <laughs> um, I think we can all use that. So in our experience so far, we've seen um, a very big upswing in, um, in engagement, in, uh, in seeking, uh, I think the, the, the notion of what has been spoken about is very much true across the board in terms of people are really seeking and craving that human contact, that human uh, togetherness. And, you know, I don't think it's a big surprise, but in times of crisis, people do seek and they want to, uh, they're struggling. And I think that's what Pew is, is showing in, the, in their reports. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing, you know, in, in many ways, higher level of engagement in our, um, in our weekly 
um, sessions of Torah study in our prayer services on Zoom. You know, granted Wednesday afternoon, <clears throat> excuse me, Wednesday afternoon, three o'clock, you know, it's not usually the slot that's prime, prime time, but now people have time. And whether it's because they have time, whether it's because people are feeling, you know, genuinely, and, and of course, factually, people are really feeling very, uh, very, very, um, they're feeling the pain of this as we all are. But I would say that, that we're seeing an upswing and the challenge I would propose for this observation and that I know we'll address further in this call and beyond is how do we, how do we bottle that up? How do we capture the upswing and engagement. Uh, every day at one o'clock, the OU uh, has a gathering of prayer. Um, it's a short psalm, a few, a few words of Torah. We have 1,500 a day on average uh, chime in. Uh, we would never pull that off uh, in any other time. So we're, we're, so, we're sort of seeking ways to bottle that up and capture it. It's, it's, um, it's somewhat surprising, to be honest. I don't know that we could have anticipated, obviously, any of this, but even some of those practices are not things that I think we could have predicted. But I also wonder how, what will happen after. Will we be able to capture where are those nuggets? Observation uh, number two. Um, we're seeing, um, as was alluded to by Adina, sort of an unprecedented disruption leading to what I would say unprecedented innovation. You know, synagogues, uh, institutions at large are, have been forced to innovate, you know, with technology, without technology, f phone calls to each, that's a beautiful thing that was just shared, a phone call to every individual, uh, you know, member of a synagogue. I got a call myself from one of my children's schools. I don't think they ever called me about anything positive for sure. They wanted to see how we were doing. And it was very genuine and very real. And I think that the unprecedented innovation is something that, um, again, I'm looking through the lens of, of ritual practice within our institutions. You know, um, we'll, you know, we cry with our friends and with our with our congregants that we can't be at the, by their side at their funeral, at their shiva. But I have been able, sadly, to participate in many funerals more than I would like to admit. But I don't know that I would have gone to those funerals, and they number the in the hundreds, hundreds of of people being able to be part of that sort of ritual practice, albeit differently. And again, I wonder and, and challenge, will that continue? You know, what's gonna happen on a Wednesday morning when I'm traveling, as was alluded to also, when the trains are running and life is back to normal. But I think we've seen that interesting, unprecedented innovation and creativity. Once again, how do we bottle that up? How do we sort of capture that and, and make that part of, of who we are, recognizing that ritual practice is relationship and in person for sure. No one's gonna argue here, at least not from this side, I don't think, of the, of the panel, that technology should replace. No, I don't think there is a place for that, but, we, but it does have a place for supplementing, for reaching beyond within our membership and beyond. And the third observation I'll share briefly is I think we've really seen, again, unprecedented disruption leading to unprecedented unity of ritual. Um, it was alluded to Shabbat around the world. You know, practices that could never have even, they wouldn't have been thought of globally between synagogues. Yes, just yesterday, um, on a call with, I was on a call with UJA, led by Adina and Nadine. It seems like a daily, uh, what time is the call tomorrow? You'll invite me. It's a daily occurrence. You know, I'm sitting on a call with members of other denominations, and we're brainstorming ideas about Shavuot, uh, practices of ritual, how we're going to prepare for the upcoming holiday. That would not have happened prior to this. And once again, I wonder, how will we capture that? How will we, um, you know, propel forward? not just uh, on a very practical measure, how are we going to capture that when we go back to our big Knesset, when we go back to gather in person, how can we make sure that all these innovations and all of these, uh, all the seeking of our community is captured, bottled, and propels us to, uh, to a whole new community that I think perhaps we would not have been able to imagine. So those are the observations I would share. And of course, I'll reflect more on challenges later on. And I welcome others to uh, share on the ritual end, at least in terms of observation. Wonderful, thank you so much. And we will have an opportunity to open it up if there are uh, additional perspectives that, that we want to share on any of these arenas. Um, so I want to move now to, um, to Jacob, if you would share, please, uh, your observations on the financial, the immediate and short-term financial impact on synagogues and spiritual communities. Sure, first of all, it's great to be here. And uh, thank you to Adina, Tamar, Nadine, for putting this together. Um, I actually, I would much of what I would really want to talk about, Nadine shared at the very beginning in her assessment. Uh, the numbers may be a little different after 
uh, you know, many, a large percentage of our synagogues have managed to gain SBA loans, uh, which hopefully will turn into grants. And that has alleviated, I think, short term through June 30th, some of the pressure, although congregations, of course, as all of us are developing our, our budgets for the next fiscal year, starting July 1st for most of them. And there's a lot of stress and anxiety around what that looks like. Um, fee-for-service programs, nursery schools, after-school care, daycare, day camp, congregations that really rely on those funding streams are like JCCs in very, very difficult financial shape especially if they want to maintain um, support for their for their employees. Um, uh, membership dues, as unemployment increases, uh, those dues will fall, and it's still a major model uh, for most of our congregations. Um, falling endowments, uh, many of our congregations don't have substantial reserves, um, and a lot of anxiety around high holidays, which also are a major financial model, for better or worse, uh, for many of our congregations. This is a moment to innovate away from that, but it will still in the short term be very, very difficult. Um, it's resulting in furloughs, layoffs, salary reductions. I get calls from rabbis uh, every day concerned about um, you know, their status with the congregation or their, the, the status of their contract and their financial arrangement. Um, and I'll just note the irony very quickly, which is that what we're hearing so far is that our synagogue professionals and clergy are are working harder than ever. The dominant theme that I hear when I speak with uh, my colleagues as rabbis, when I speak with synagogue presidents, even executive directors, is they are exhausted. The need to innovate, the need to put an entire synagogue program online, they are working harder than ever. The need to call every member and then follow up on their needs. It's exhausting. And at the same time, um, they are having conversations about cutting salary, about cutting staff, about the need to maintain their sustainability. Um, and that is a very, very difficult space to be in. And it challenges, I think, what Rabbi Braus um, challenged us to do, which is to also be in a space of actually stepping back and being able to really think about this moment and what we're learning. It, it, it's, it, it's an important piece for us to try to, to square the circle on. Thank you for sharing those observations. And I just wanna give a little shout out here. I know that there's a lot of incredible work that is happening, but as you're stepping into your role, I think that there, you know, you've already started to demonstrate some tremendous leadership around um, what the moment calls for in terms of bringing together um, collective thinking, even within your own movement. And, um, and there's a lot of great examples of that that are emerging now um, because these are unprecedented times that call for you know, lots of smart people to come together and collect both resources and thinking and creativity. So really, really kudos to you on that. Um, I want to name two additional ironies on the financial front before we move to innovation. Um, one that was mentioned on the movement call yesterday that uh, that was referenced, which is that ironically, the impact on small or large congregations has been significantly different. Um, there are certain particular differences that we're seeing, for example, um, congregations that have what are now what, what might have been assets but are now turning into liabilities in the financial impact moment. If you're maintaining a, a large building, for example, um, if you have not yet paid off your mortgage, um, these are these are right now serving as significant liabilities for synagogues. Whereas perhaps smaller congregations or those without buildings, um, I think are you know, in a different moment in time. Um, similarly, so those that, depending on your financial model, those um, who have relied largely upon program revenue, opposed to um, philanthropic support, um, donations, or for the, the few fortunate who have endowments, things like that, which few of our far between, I think you're seeing, a, a, you know, you're going to see also significant differences in impact. Um, and finally, I'll mention that Nadine and I have been on a number of calls with, with synagogue leaders in New York, and that we're seeing some um, interesting opening around looking at different financial models now. We, we've done a significant amount of work around exploring, for example, the voluntary dues model and other models. And we're, we're seeing in that leapfrog way that we described earlier, just a uh, much more of an interest and an opening to exploring those models now um, in this, as synagogues are absorbing the, the overall impact economically. 
So uh, I know that we've mentioned a number of innovations, Nadine, so don't feel, don't feel obligated to repeat those, but if there are um, specific innovations that you're seeing across synagogues, I think there's much to be inspired by in this moment and that we want to harness as we um, move forward and we think about the future. So before we pivot to the longer term impact, um, I'm going to turn it back to you uh, if there are specific innovations that you're seeing to lift up. Definitely, and I wanted to highlight something that Rabbi Blumenthal had ended with, which I think is a really important point to mention, is that what we're hearing often, and I'm sure across the board, that professional staff and clergy are exhausted. They are asking to do much more and with limited amount and continually asked to cut back on staffing and other resources, and yet they're running 24-7. So, the spaces of an innovation and engagement that I think are interesting in these moments are where they're looking to volunteers to really take on some of the work off of their shoulders. So in one example, um, many synagogues moved into this idea of small groups um, when they were meeting in real life, as they say, and now have turned that program uh, virtually and their rabbis are taking the time to train their, their lay leaders to run those moments um, in all different types of ways. And that's a really positive experience, not only about empowering volunteers, but also giving the clergy some moments to take a step back and just some, a little downtime as they're all grappling with health issues or with their own family issues and everything that we're all going through. And having, it's important for, I think, our communities to also realize that we need to take care of each other. And that includes taking care of the professional staff. Um, Another sighting of uh, collaboration and partnership around innovation, which we're starting to see, which also I think reduce, reduces the amount of work on everyone's shoulders is um, around um, partnership around holidays or other um, speakers and our events. I think in the beginning, everyone was feeling that we need to turn everything virtually and we're gonna take everything that we're doing and putting it online. And what we, they learned very fast, fast that that's not a sustainable model. Um, so, you know, we talk a lot about that and a lot of people have reported on that this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And how are we going to continue to do this? We, no one knows what the next day brings. We don't know what the end side is. And we really need to think about sustainability. So the more that we can help synagogues and um, leadership think about the ways that they can strength, strengthen their muscles around collaboration and partnership, I think would be a win for all of us across the board. Great. So that gives us just a hint of some of the short-term impacts on the synagogue and spiritual community sector. And we have alluded, a number of the speakers have alluded to how some of these short-term impacts might translate into longer-term impacts. Uh, much of this for all of us is speculation. Um, we are, I think, in, across all of our personal and professional lives, I think, caught in a moment of trying to project, trying to predict with all of the information that is at our fingertips and with our imaginations, hopefully. Um, but I will ask, um, instead of turning to each one, I'm just going to open it now to, to all the panelists and just unmute yourselves if you have something to say. Perhaps we'll just take um, a couple of minutes if there hasn't been anything said around the, the longer term impacts. What is it that synagogues are going to take from this moment um, into the longer term as we're seeing it? How will this impact person in-person virtual engagement? These are just some of the questions that have come up. What is the longer term economic impact or impact on the financial model that's been hinted at? Um, to what extent are we thinking about um, consolidations, mergers, partnerships, creative partnerships, closing? Um, what's the role of scenario planning? So I'm just going to open it up with all of that to the particular to the panelists and then we very much want to um, leave the last uh, 10 minutes or so for the group to to talk about uh, the question of the hour, which is really what is the role of philanthropy in this moment? So to our panelists um, to chime in around the longer term impact. Um, I'm happy to go first. Um, I think I alluded to the notion of um, the purpose of the congregation and deeply understanding the purpose of the congregation. Um, how that's playing out though, in terms of how, what happens on the ground are questions uh, around economic model and what does it mean, <clears throat> what does it mean to be a community um, it also speaks to the notion of geographic reach. Um, many of our congregations, as they move online, are starting to engage audiences um, around the world, uh, literally. And, and so a congregation that may have thought of itself as 
um, engaging congregants within walking distance or within five miles or 10 miles um, is now starting to think very differently um, about who their audience <coughs> is and who they serve. Um, also job definition. What, what is my job and what is my role? What are my tasks and, um, and what is my responsibility? Um, what's the line between uh, what clergy and staff do and what volunteers do as, as we seek to engage leaders who deliver, not just leaders who are in positions. Um, and then finally, I think as, as Nadine alluded to, the notion of partnership. Um, we are seeing lots and lots of partnerships. Uh, a wonderful thing that's happened, for example, is our small congregations rabbis have put together a, um, a schedule of teaching on Shavuot. And they're going to be teaching all night long. Um, and they're going to be teaching to each other's congregants, where normally none of those congregations would have gone all night long. Um, now they're able to offer a, a, a full menu of options during each hour because they're collaborating um, in a different way. And we're excited about um, those collaborations. And I think Ari is, as you noted, and Jacob, we have all been on the phone together multiple times this week. Teresa Grauer from uh, Reconstructionist Movement is also on the call. I've seen all of these. We are all collaborating um, um, more and differently um, as well. And I think that's being reflected in our congregations. That's wonderful. And, and thank you for notice, noting Tressa. I was just going to actually invite Tressa to share um, if she's seeing any of these longer term impacts and would echo the sentiments or has new thoughts as it pertains to the Reconstructionist congregations around the country. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Adina. I will say, I, I mean, thank you so much to the other representatives from the other movements for saying what you have. I would echo a lot of what you've said. And I want to add a couple of things just because our congregations by and large are smaller than some of the others in the movements and the, the questions that are facing smaller congregations are in fact different. And I am, I am interested in thinking about what that means moving forward. I think the participatory model of Reconstructionist congregations has led to collaboration uh, that is just being um, um, re-emphasized re at this point in, in, a re in really beautiful ways. One more long-term thing I wanna add is what this means, what the notion moving forward of moving more things online, because I don't think we're going to go back to what we have, a, what we have understood to be the norm. I think that has changed uh, for, it, it, forever in whatever way that there is some kind of hybrid model that is going to include the, the benefits of, 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 uh, of online opportunities. Um, I, that is most notable for those who are finding it physically dif difficult to attend services. And so the accessibility opportunities that are available with online offerings is huge, I think. And I th that we're hearing a lot of recognition that um, some people's experiences that have that that were true before these days are, are being experienced by more people now in a recognition that bringing more um, bringing more people into the room virtually is, is, is a great gift. Great, Tressa, thank you so much. So I know that there's lots more to be said. I'm just going to, in the interest of time, because I really do want to open it to, um, to the funder community, um, I want to just open up with a question and, and maybe just ask Nadine to super quick kick off um, from UJ Federation's perspective to us, answer the question around what is the unique and critical role for philanthropy to play in this moment, both in terms of addressing immediate and long-term needs, um, and to lift up and ensure the thriving of our synagogues and spiritual communities, which is really the, the ultimate goal for us. How we might amplify innovation, what our role might be in in meeting the critical needs and being proactive about future scenario planning. Um, so Nadine, just if you would just put on your, your hat here as funder and to share a little bit about what our approach has been um, from a philanthropic space, how we've approached um, our work in New York, and then we'll open it up to the group. Thanks, Adina. So, so three um, examples I ha I'll highlight based on the needs assessment data that I shared with you at the beginning of this presentation. Um, one of them was around, as Jacob Blumenthal uh, spoke about, it was around the SBA loans. Um, we offered, when the JFNA was working with us and providing resources around information and how to complete the SBA loans um, paperwork, we also offered 
uh, financial advisors who could work one-on-one -on -one with synagogues as we, we understood it to be a very complicated process for them. Many synagogues don't have sophisticated staff that can take that on on their own, um, as well as, as if anyone followed the conversation, it was changing by the minute about what and how and when to file. Um, so right now we're looking at those responses of coming in. We had about 60 synagogues um, who took us up on being matched with a financial consultant. And from the numbers that are being put in pack, there is substantial um, loans that have been received by those congregations that we really truly feel will be made, um, will make a huge difference to them. So that was, I, I think, a really um, good step that we took to supporting synagogues financially at this time. Um, the second one that we uh, focused on was really helping the vulnerable uh, members of congregations. So UJA um, offered uh, the Board of Rabbis across the New York area um, and other rabbinic associations a uh, grant of $600,000 to help think through of how do we really help those who are most vulnerable in our scenario communities. Um, so right now we're working through all sorts of different proposals um, and grants that were really for those who are mostly isolated. I could tell you what's really rising to the surface, which shouldn't really come as a surprise, is, surprise, is around mental health um, and food insecurity in New York. Those seem to be the two critical issues. Um, so we're looking to our partner agencies mostly, which are there are a number of them that can help um, and provide different types of interve um, interventions in those areas. Um, and then lastly, in just in terms of innovation and, and within congregations, we've been working with Spark, who's helped us, uh, it was worked with UJ over a number of viewers about creating spaces for innovation within legacy institutions. Um, Back in January, we all opened uh, a new experience actually for that program to go completely online virtually, but it was supposed to be a seven month process. As soon as we started hearing about COVID, um, we flipped the grant around and we actually pushed up the timeline so that there could be rapid response. So instead of taking seven months, we wanted to provide the synagogues who are willing to go on the journey and speed it up and so that they could be responsive in the moment to the people who needed the support now, micro grants. And there are a few congregations who have taken us up on that and really coming up with very, very innovative approaches to um, help those in need. Great, Nadine, that's so helpful. So we have our first question. The question around the balance between local resources supporting individual synagogues and local communities versus um, the, the broader impact, thinking about the field, is one that we wrestle with every day, as I'm sure many funders do when you, um, if you're funding in a particular uh, community with a large number of congregations or nationally or even globally. Um, and I'd be curious how, how others approach this. What is your, um, what is your approach and how you think about the, the balance of local, which is um, you know, local knowledge, local specificity, uh, versus the scale and the potential of creating impact um, you know, more wholesale, so wholesale versus retail. You know, I'm glad to share. For, uh, at the Orthodox Union, we have the government relations arm. Um, it's called the Teach Coalition and or, OU Advocacy. So we work nationally, but operate locally with representatives on the ground. We do it side to side in partnership with JFNA um, and, and other partners. And you know, any way that we could be helpful to any synagogues across the country, we're glad to do so. But we do think of it nationally, but we operate locally. A lot of the uh, funding sources are local and state driven. Um, so it does require um, a working knowledge and base in terms of the players and the issues, and they do differ from state to state. So I'll sort of offer that to everyone here. If we could be a resource, I'd be glad to uh, connect. And I'll just amplify what Ari mentioned. I see Jacob, you've unmuted yourself too, that we often think about it in terms of, of leverage. So we are in, in constant conversations with, um, with partners, both nationally and locally, to think about how we might um, how we might work together. So a number of examples have been lifted up, how we can leverage government dollars that are out there. We can never replace the government funding that exists, which is why we seized on that opportunity to um, help our synagogues access the SBA funding. We also are now working very, trying to work very closely with the umbrella organizations and the movements in particular around how to access the um, JCRIF funding, the JFNA and, and funder pool that's been developed. Um, because the marrying of our local knowledge and relationships 
with congregations, with again those the dollars that are available um, from a from a larger scale. I think is a, is a way that we think about um, approaching some of that. Jacob, did you want to add something? Yeah, I would just say, uh, you know, of course, it's a balance and a, and a mix. And what I think, what I'm, one of the themes that I think we're hearing on this in this conversation is the sense that this is a moment of vulnerability. And vulnerability, while scary, is also a moment of opportunity. Um, and um, it's interesting now being part of a, you know, I came from a small congregation. Now I'm working, uh, you know, with an umbrella or with umbrella organizations. And to think about how we take the themes that we've heard in this call, you know, synagogues becoming hybrids of what happens in a building, what happens in people's homes and in communities, and then what happens online. Um, the relationships that we're building the sense of networking and collaboration, the need for consolidation. Those are big themes. And to have also dollars extended um, that can help us push on our synagogues to embrace the changes that they're making and to see how they can do that, to create the incentives and, and projects and grants um, you know, in, in partnership with the funder community um, is really great. I think what we're seeing is that synagogues had been seen as led as legacy institutions that were that were really not able to do innovation. And I think one of the big things that we're seeing now is that first of all, synagogues are the the bedrocks of our communities. They are they are tying together hundreds of thousands or millions of Jews across the globe, um, and that they can do that innovation if we are able to um, to really work with them and help them understand the big trends and ideas. They react very quickly with tremendous creativity. Wonderful. Uh, so we have a couple of other comments in the chat. Yes, um, and then I know we have to probably come to a close so we can finish right at uh, at two o'clock tomorrow. I'm looking for your yes, confirmation. Yes, we do. And I'm um, so I know it's two o'clock right now, so maybe we can go just a minute or two, being respectful of everybody's time that I'm sure needs to jump off. And I'm going to take down those questions and also want to encourage you to reach out to me at tamar at jfunders.org. I was gonna say this then, but I'll say it now. This is, was always intended to be really the beginning of a conversation of bringing people and stakeholders, like we said before, that care about this space to, to consider all these questions that you're bringing up and consider all the different issues that might arise. So this was just, I wanna thank all of the presenters that, that brought us so much information. It was really just the beginning. So please reach out if you want to continue this conversation so we can program for that in the coming weeks and months. Right. Uh, and I want to I want to echo the thank you to, to the panelists who are incredibly busy um, and who made the time to share their wisdom. And I know that they would welcome any outreaches if you wanted to follow up specifically. Um, I want to thank you for the the work, the courageous work that you're doing and that you are about to do as a community of funders to really think about holding our communities, not only the synagogue sector, but all of the sectors in our communities to, to, to hold them and to move, help us to move into the future and to echo and bring back the words that Sharon began with, which is to say, let's not rush into this moment. Let's be quiet and still and and really hone and come back to what the core principles are of our community. What are the essentials? Who do we want to be in this moment? What are our core values? What is the role of each of the sectors and spaces? And then to be courageous, to have um, moral you know, clarity and to have imaginations in this moment. So thank you very much. We welcome partnership and, and please be in touch if there's any way in which uh, we, any of us can be helpful. I know that Tamar has our, our contact information. Wonderful. All right, very good. Thank you all again. And thank you to the presenters. And just to let you know, one more plug for the other things that are going on at, at JFN right now, please go to our website at jfunders.org. We have so many different programs going on almost every day. Adina referenced the, the fund, there's a new fund that's going to be opening up soon. We actually have a briefing on that on Monday so people understand what it is and how to get involved. And there's many things like that going on in the coming weeks. So please look, look into the different programs you might be interested in and reach out if I can be helpful. Thank you all.